Um, but it's never quite that easy, and uh, some very smart people uh, started to look at how you would actually do it in practice, step by step. There's this guide that they came out with. This is both based mainly on the European experience, because there's so much ahead of us. But they also looked at some of the state plans here uh, in the US. But like, what matters? What seems to make marine spatial planning work? How would you do it? And they came up with this guide, marine spatial planning, a step-by-step -step approach toward ecosystem-based management. Um, and what's, what did they say? What were, the, what were the main ideas behind marine spatial planning? And the way I read it, there are three things that distinguish marine spatial planning from other kinds of management. And I'll back up here as a second that's related to that first element. It's multi-objective, balances ecological, social, economic, and governance objectives. People have called things marine spatial planning that I would not call marine spatial planning. So for example, I don't know if any of you have been involved with or have heard about in California, they're trying to put more marine protected areas off the coast of California. There's been quite a, a big effort and uh, it's been quite controversial in a lot of ways. They're trying to cite a lot of marine, whatever you want to call it, reserves, parks, protected areas. But that's all they're looking at. And people have said, well, that's a kind of marine spatial planning. But so long as you're just citing one thing, if I'm just citing oil rigs, m m the Minerals Management Service says they do marine spatial planning because they plan where there's going to be oil leases and where there's going to be drilling. I wouldn't call either of those things uh, marine spatial planning because they're only looking to cite one particular use. And the whole idea of marine spatial planning is to bring all the users together and, and uh, plan in a more unified way. It's got to be multi-objective. Obviously, it's got to be spatially focused. Uh, there are all kinds of regulations, right? We regulate virtually everything, how many fish you can catch and how you clean the ballast water in your ship. Those are regulations. They're not spatial planning. They don't have that spatial focus. So you've got to define some area that you're going to be planning. And um, in a similar theme, it has to be integrated, address interactions between all the elements within the management area, including ecosystems, human activities, legal authorities. This goes back to the ecosystem-based management. You, you saw the title of that guide. It said, how to use marine spatial planning to achieve ecosystem-based management. And I think this, this last point um, it goes to that ecosystem-based management. Let's look at the whole ecosystem and everything that's happening. So now this is a slightly more detailed picture of what, uh, what that UNESCO guide says, how to do marine spatial planning. I'm going to walk through the steps, but again, we might want to come back to talk about some of them in more detail. The first thing to notice is engage this engaged stakeholders up in the top left which goes to at every possible stage. So everyone agrees if this is going to happen, if it's going to work, you've got to have a broad range of people involved in giving input. So that's, you keep in your mind all the time. So the first thing to do, you need to figure out what area you're managing. It could be relatively small. There are people looking at um, Long Island Sound. There are people looking at you know, some of the, um, uh, the waterways around New York City and trying to do marine spatial planning. And you can do that, but of course, you know, the smaller area, the more you have forces from the outside that you're not considering. Or you can do it on very large areas, large marine ecosystems, regions, which are, you know, much of, much of the coastline, including all the way out to the EZ. So there's lots of different ways to define the area, but that's the first thing you have to do. Once you've defined what area you're looking at, you need to think about goals and objectives for that area. And again, very heavily stakeholder driven is our main objective for this area that we're um, desperate for jobs and we want to do anything that promotes jobs, which could mean a lot of different things. Could mean more recreation, could mean more industry, that could mean a lot of things. Is uh, conservation pr uh, the most important priority for this area for various reasons? And of course, the answer in most places is going to be some balance. We want to maintain healthy shorelines, we want to support our tourism industry, we also need power, so maybe we can do some renewable energy or in some areas non-renewable energy. Um, but that's your first, first step. Um, then you need lots of information and that's always difficult and it's easy to say we don't have enough information and you see the box on the right there, gather spatial data on both the ecosystems and the human uses. 
I would change that actually slightly now because I've decided that humans are part of ecosystems. And so we can't separate ecosystems and humans, but that's, most people don't, if you just say ecosystems, people don't think about the humans. Um, so you get as much data as you can, but again, as anyone who's ever done any kind of management knows, you can always get more information when you've got to do the best you can with the information you have. So it's a constant process of trying to gather information, but you put whatever you can together. Um, then you come up with some kind of spatial plan, you implement the plan, you have a monitoring program. Again, anybody in the ocean world, coastal world knows that we have this sense of adaptive management. You mount on the outcomes to see if your plan's working, evaluate it, and then go back to gathering data, revising the plan, implementing that, monitoring the outcomes of that, see how that worked, and keep iterating that. I don't know why the arrows between these boxes disappear. <laughs> But you're supposed to be going down arrows through the list. So now here we come to something sort of interesting. Um, as people start talking about marine spatial planning, we found that the environmental groups were pretty excited about it, right on top of it, and um, you know, definitely saw how it might help protect oceans. But the ocean user community, what I call the, the, all the ocean industry people who are going to make their money and create jobs and create whatever it is, power or fish or other kinds of food or whatever it is, they had not heard of marine spatial planning. They were very, very skeptical, very suspicious of it, that it was a plot. By, and they, I, I did a lot of interviews two years ago. I did extensive interviews with Ocean Industry, and their view was this is a plot by the environmental community. They're just putting a new spin on wanting to close off the ocean, and we won't be allowed to do anything, and it's going to be the end of ocean uses. So we worked with them. We had a series of meetings over the course of the last two years trying to explain what marine spatial planning is, that it's not meant to close off the ocean. It's meant to create balance, and they would be involved, and that they're stakeholders. And here are some of the things that came out from those discussions, some of the things that they were concerned about, some of the things that they thought marine spatial planning should take into account. They absolutely agreed that you need to have some clear economic, social, and environmental goals up front. And in fact, we're very keen to um, have the government, the federal government, acknowledge that what they were doing is valuable. So by saying we have a goal that we want the oceans to produce a certain amount of food, whether that's through aquaculture or fishing, um, we want the ocean to help meet our energy needs. We want the ocean to, um, oceans and coasts, to provide a sense of community, continuity, and culture, which historically they've been, you know, the coasts have been the center of a lot of the culture in the country. So as far as they were concerned, being more specific about what it is we're looking for from the ocean was a good thing. Focus on the future. Uh, in other words, not to go back and rehash things that were there. Uh, obviously, when you're doing marine spatial planning, one of the things you're stuck with is that there's some stuff that's there already. And they were very concerned about saying we were going to tear everything down, stop everything, and start from scratch, understandably. They felt that there were a lot of things that were compatible, a lot of uses that were compatible. So they were very wary of the idea that you would zone for a single use. Like you would have a map and you'd say, OK, all the windmills are going to go here, and all the aquaculture is going to go here, and fishing's only going to go here. They said, we don't need that kind of single use zoning because a lot of these uses are compatible. They're through the water column, or they don't interfere with each other. That was a big point for them. Keep the process open, transparent, participatory. That's classic kind of stakeholder engagement. Allow for regional flexibility, and use existing regional bodies wherever possible. They felt that there was a lot going on. They were very afraid, and this, again, anybody who reads the newspaper, this will sound familiar very afraid of having this be a centralized federal bureaucracy based in Washington telling everybody what they need to do with their coasts and oceans. So they wanted this to be devolved to a regional level. It kind of goes beyond any individual state because we are talking about 
uh, going beyond state waters, and obviously there's cross flow. So they saw it as a regional issue, and they wanted to build on existing regional bodies. And again, we can talk about that more later. I won't go into a lot of detail, but right now there are regional agreements in uh, six. There's six regional compacts now. Um, the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, the Gulf, the you know, West Coast. So they have these regional agreements, and they wanted to use those wherever possible. They felt it was, from their point of view, extremely important to have some certainty involved so that it wasn't going to be, well, we'll do a plan, and then we'll do a new plan two years from then, and we'll do a new plan, and we'll change it all the time, because from their point of view, there are people investing billions of dollars in infrastructure, and they needed to have, to be able to get inve investment money, they needed to have some level of certainty. 